Jim Bridenstine serves as the administrator of NASA, and he's our guest on Newsmakers this week, and thanks for joining us. Thank you. Great to be here. And joining him in the questioning is Christian Davenport of The Washington Post, covers the space and defense industries, and Jeff Faust, a senior writer for Space News. To both of you, thanks for joining us. Mr. Faust, start us off. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Administrator, on Wednesday, you announced that you were resigning a couple of key administration officials, uh, including... Bill Gerstenmeyer, the longtime associate administrator for human exploration and operations. Why make that change and why do so now? So um, we, we just reassigned him to a different role inside of NASA. He's a, a great American, a great patriot. He has served NASA for 42 years and we love him. Um, but it's also true that um, we're, we're moving to a new era in human spaceflight um, where the administration is interested in going fast we're interested in doing things in a different way. Um, and I believed it was important to have new leadership at the top of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. It was, it was entirely my decision. Um, but at the end of the day, um, we need to make, be very clear that NASA is committed to cost and schedule. Safety is the highest priority, but we are, we are committed to cost and schedule. And um, I just thought it was important to make this, uh, make this change at this time. Just a quick follow on that, Mr. Administrator. You're coming at a time when we're about to celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11, about to fly crews from American soil for the first time, and as you mentioned, the Artemis program of returning to the moon, and then you reassign the head of human exploration. I'm just curious if you could give us some insight into the timing of that. Why was that done at this moment? So we're, <laughs> excuse me, we are landing on the south pole of the moon with the next man and the first woman in the year 2024. We don't have a lot of time to waste. If we're going to have new leadership, it needs to happen now. Um, so a lot of things have to go right to achieve the objective. Uh, and in fact, the schedule matters. And the schedule matters not just um, we, what happened 50 years ago we're thrilled about, we're proud of, we love it. It gives us an opportunity to talk about what's next. The Artemis program where we go back to the moon sustainably with our eyes on Mars. All of that is important. But at the same time, the objective is 2024, and we need to move out quickly on all of our decisions, not waste time, but move quickly. Uh, and NASA is, is moving into that era rapidly. The person who will replace Gerstenmaier, you have an acting uh, uh, individual in there now, Ken Bowersock, but you've mentioned you're looking for a permanent replacement. What's gonna be their priorities coming in? What sort of decisions are you expecting them to have to make? So the first thing that we're going to do is they're going to put together a team at the top of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. So it's the head of that mission directorate. But then there's the Exploration Systems uh, Development uh, Division Director. That person, of course, is responsible for SLS, the largest rocket ever built that will take our astronauts all the way to the moon, and the Orion crew capsule, the capsule that our astronauts will fly in. Um, and then we are working towards having a separate division called Moon to Mars, which includes uh, the Gateway, which is a small habitat, a small space station in orbit around the moon uh, and a landing system to get our astronauts to the surface of the moon. So we'll have a new person at the head of that as well. So we're looking at three total individuals to create that top team at the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. And we will be looking for them to look at the programs and come up with their own baseline schedules and costs and then ultimately have them execute according to those baseline co as costs and schedule so that we can get uh, the next man and the first woman to the South Pole of the Moon in the year 2024. Can we talk just for a minute about cost of the Artemis program? You what you think that's going to be? We've had seen some fluctuating numbers. I know you've got an initial budget request or additional request to Congress. Yes. Um, what the numbers are and what is your strategy? Because if you said you've said many times the challenges aren't just technical, they're political, and how you're going to sell this to particularly Democrats on the Hill to get the funding that you need to meet this mandate by the White House? So it, it, the, the, the challenge is political for sure, but it's not partisan. It's not Republican or Democrat. It's largely parochial. Uh, that's the challenge largely at NASA in general, not, not necessarily partisan. Uh, that, that being said, um, when we talk about the budget, uh, the president gave us, he said, we need to go to the moon faster. We need to go to the moon within five years with the technologies that can ultimately be used for a mission to Mars. That's the goal. Um, and not only did he say to go faster, but he gave us an amendment to the budget request that enables us to achieve that. In the year 2020, uh, we received a $1.6 billion plus up 
that didn't come out of NASA yet maintains the budget caps. It doesn't come out of uh, the budget cap at all. The budget caps are the same, but we have 1.6 billion additional dollars specific to NASA. Um, and that enables us in the year 2020 to do what is necessary to build the lander, uh, to get the lander started, if you will, so that we can land on the surface of the moon in 2024. Uh, that being said, as you can imagine, any development program like a lunar lander, a moon lander, follows the normal traditional path of a development program, which starts low and it gets high. It's a bell curve, so it goes up and then back down. And in that bell curve, you can imagine 2021 will be a little bit higher, 2022 will be a little bit higher. We have not put specific numbers on it. Uh, I have given a range, uh, 20 billion to 30 billion over the course of five years to build a sustainable lunar architecture on top of our already existing budget. Um, we, I've given that range, but the reality is what we're learning is that there are other people that want to contribute to this, international partners and commercial partners that want to put their own skin into the game. They want to invest their own money. Why? Because they want customers that are not NASA. And if they can have customers that are not NASA, it drives down our costs and increases access to the moon for a lot of people. Um, so if, if they want to invest their own money, we welcome that. So I can tell you today, it, it's very realistic that it could come in well under the $20 billion. When I gave that original range, I was thinking, okay, if NASA's doing this alone, what's it gonna look like? Well, if NASA does it with international partners, commercial partners, we can actually drive down the cost. You talked about that $1.6 billion you've asked for fiscal year 2020. The House has passed an appropriations bill that doesn't include that $1.6 billion. The yes. Senate hasn't taken up their version. Uh, what's your strategy for getting that funding, and what happens as is likely that we start uh, the 2020 fiscal year on a continuing resolution? So given the traditional budgets of NASA, we put together a plan to get to the moon by the year 2028. As you're aware, the President and the Vice President, they are not keen on waiting around long periods of time to accomplish stunning things. They want to go faster. So they said, okay, what can we do? Can we get there earlier? How do we get there earlier? Uh, we put together a plan at NASA. We said we can land in 2024, but it's going to require an additional budget uh, and we'll need an amendment. Uh, they, they, in fact, gave us that. They're putting the money where their mouth is. So that's a very important uh, distinction. It is also true um, that the week that that budget amendment came out, was the week that the House appropriators were marking up the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Bill, which funds NASA. Um, so the idea that we're gonna roll out a budget request, the week they're marking it up and they're gonna incorporate it into their budget, that just, it's not realistic. So a lot of people read that as, oh, well, they're not supportive. It is not true. I've talked to people on both sides of the aisle that are, in fact, very, very supportive. Um, the challenge is they just didn't have the time. Now, that, their bill has passed. Um, but the whole process goes through the House initially. The Senate has to pass a bill. And if we can get the $1.6 in the Senate bill, then when it's conferenced, that's when we can come together and say, okay, here's what we need for the Moon program in a bipartisan way um, and actually pass a bill that allows us to achieve the objective. So um, the process has only just begun. Um, I'm confident that it can be achieved. I do worry that we will end up in a CR, and if that happens, uh, we need to look at how NASA can move forward in some kind of an anomaly. Um, but, uh, but at this point, uh, we are working the process the way the U.S. government works to achieve the end state, uh, and we're confident that we can put together the pieces. Administrator, to the larger issue of human space flight, C-SPAN just conducted a poll with Ipsos, and one of the questions we asked about priorities for NASA on the top of that list from our respondents saying studying changes to the Earth's environment and things like that, towards the bottom of that list, exploration, including the Moon and the Mars. What, what do you think about those results and how does that square with what NASA's mission is? Uh, number one, uh, we do believe that studying the Earth is a priority. And it, it always has been at NASA and it always will be. And in fact, right now, um, again, within, within the budget caps, we are spending um, as much money as we ever have on Earth science. We are studying the Earth in every part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, and so, bipartisan, we are committed uh, to studying the Earth. It is also true um, that, in my view, Americans are very committed to space exploration. Um, and I, you know, I saw your poll and, and I saw some of those numbers, but I would also say, um, here we are 50 years after Apollo, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo. Um, by the way, that was not, during the, the Apollo program, it was not a, it was not an, a, a popular program. But ultimately, when it was achieved, that monumental, stunning achievement was not only popular when it was complete, but it's popular 50 years after it was complete. People love Apollo. 
and now we have a new program named after the twin sister of Apollo. Her name is Artemis. Artemis ha happens to be the goddess of the moon. And this time when we go to the moon, we're going with a very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps that includes women. So we can send women to the moon under a program named after Apollo's twin sister, Artemis. The story, in my view, is absolutely beautiful. Um, but that, the, the polling numbers indicate that space exploration is a necessity. Overwhelmingly, people believe space exploration, it says necessary, yes or no, 77% or something like that said yes. What is space exploration? It's going to the moon, it's going to Mars, and it's going beyond. So I think it's important to note that Americans support space exploration in general. I think it's also important to note um, that this unique capability that we have built um, and that we are continuing to build has resulted in economic opportunity, not just for the United States, but for the entire world. I want to talk for a second. When we talk about the way we communicate, Direct TV, Dish Network, some people will probably be watching this on Direct TV, Dish Network, maybe internet, internet broadband from space. I come from Oklahoma, a lot of parts of rural Oklahoma. You don't have television if you don't have television from space. You don't have internet if you don't have internet broadband from space. These communication capabilities were born from this little agency called NASA that gets less than one half of 1% of the federal budget, but it's not just communication. Navigation, GPS, technology developed by NASA. The way we produce food, the way we produce energy, the way we do disaster relief, national security, banking, predict weather, understand how the earth is changing. All of these things born from this little agency called NASA that right now gets less than one half of 1% of the federal budget. And if you communicate to the American people all of these benefits that they receive every day from the Apollo program, if you communicate that and then you say, how important is this to you? What you will see is that overwhelmingly people believe that investing in space exploration is critical to our country. And Mr. I really believe that. Mr. Davenport. Yeah, so in, in terms of exploration, we are talking a lot about the moon, but also we could see within perhaps a matter of months or a year, the first uh, humans flying from US soil on American made rockets to space yes. since the space shuttle retired in 2011. So we've had a bit of a gap there. Yes. What is the status of that program? We've seen Boeing have problems with its spacecraft. SpaceX had hit its capsule blow up. What is the status of that investigation and do you think we'll have a flight this year? So um, I, I, I don't want to comment on whether or not we're going to get that flight complete this year. Um, I don't, I honestly don't know at this point, and I'm being honest. I've always said that, in fact, we are going to launch this year. Um, you obviously already covered the fact that we're having changes at the top of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate, and that is because we've had challenges with cost and schedule. So I will tell you this, we are committed to commercial crew. We need to make it a go. We need to launch American astronauts on American rockets from American soil, and we need to do it as soon as possible. Um, I will also tell you, um, that we have two very dissimilar rockets and two very dissimilar capsules with two commercial crew providers. What does that mean? I want the American people to know because I know you guys are space experts. What, what that means is that we're launching to low Earth orbit to the International Space Station without NASA purchasing, owning, and operating all of the hardware, which has been the tradition. Instead, we're buying a service from a commercial industry. So NASA can be one customer of many customers to drive down cost and increase access. And we can have numerous providers that are competing against each other on cost and innovation. Again, driving down cost and increasing access. That's the goal. That's why commercial crew is so important. We're using commercial capabilities to advance America's space agenda. We're doing it to low Earth orbit, the International Space Station at first. Eventually, we want to have commercial habitation be uh, available as well which NASA is helping commercial industry get there, and eventually we want to take commercial capability all the way to the moon. Um, know this, uh, we have these commercial partners. Uh, sometimes they have struggles. NASA is embedded with them, with our engineers and our technicians, um, and we are part of the investigation. You mentioned the SpaceX capsule that blew up. We are part of that investigation. Um, we are moving rapidly uh, to make these missions a reality, um, and certainly I believe it's it's possible we could get those missions launched this year. Um, and in fact, we are working towards that. And if you talk to our commercial crew provi providers, they will say that we can do that. Um, I, I am, as the NASA administrator, I want to make sure that before I go forward with what that launch date will be, 
that we know for sure that these vehicles are going to be safe. Um, and that's what we're intending to do 100%. Our astronauts are the highest priority for us, and we are going to take care of them. On our Newsmakers program, Jim Bridenstine, of, uh, news, on the NASA Administrator, uh, joining us for this conversation. Mr. Faust, go ahead. To follow up on that, um, SpaceX had a su successful test flight to the space station in March. They had a testing accident in April, destroyed the capsule. There's been a lot of criticism about the lack of openness into that investigation. What is NASA doing to address those concerns? So that criticism largely comes from me as well. So this is a new era in human spaceflight where NASA is a customer of a commercial partner and at the same time we are in fact a partner. We are embedded. We are working side by side with this commercial capability that eventually will have customers that are not NASA. Um, that being said, in this anomaly, this blow up of a capsule, um, there was no communication from the commercial partner for a period of time. That can't happen again. I've been very clear about that. I've talked to their CEO. I've said, look, Americans are investing in this side by side with your commercial company. We need to make sure that we get clarity early. And so we, we decided uh, together that following a new procedure, if something like this were to happen, within a couple of hours, we're going to do a press conference and get as much information out to the public as soon as possible. This was an uncrewed test. Remember, this is why we test. We make these discoveries before we fly with humans. So this is an important thing to remember. This was a test. This is why we test. Ultimately, we find out what went wrong. We make adjustments and we move forward. That's what NASA has always done. That's what we expect our commercial crew partners to do. They are doing it, but when there is an anomaly, if it was NASA, we would have immediately done a press conference and gotten the information out there. Commercial crew partners don't always see it the same way. We're making sure that we are in sync on how we communicate going forward. The way our astronauts get to the International Space Station today are on Russian rockets, and that's the way it's been since the shuttle went away. If there are continued delays in this commercial crew program, are you concerned that we won't have enough seats on those Russian rockets to continue a U.S. presence on the station? And at what point do you have to go out and buy more seats? So um, we, we have additional seats right now on Russian Soyuz rockets. And yes, this partnership is an important partnership that goes back. You know, we've been work, living and working with Russians on the International Space Station now for almost 20 years. Uh, that's a significant technological achievement, but it's a very significant diplomatic achievement, quite frankly, given the geopolitics uh, terrestrially. So um, it, it is absolutely true that this partnership is important. Um, if commercial crew is not ready, yes, we will have to buy additional seats. Um, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that's going to be necessary, uh, but certainly um, we will be working with our partners to, uh, to make sure that we do not lose access to the International Space Station which is a critical capability for our country, a critical capability to commercialize low Earth orbit, both with launch and habitation. The International Space Station is the tool we are using to commercialize space. Uh, and we want to make sure we don't lose access to it. So um, absolutely, it's a high priority for us. One of the uh, key elements of the exploration program is the space launch system. <clears throat> it suffered a number of delays, particularly with the core stage. Uh, in March, you suggested that NASA might skip a key test of that core stage called the Green Run test as a way of uh, speeding up the development schedule. Have you made a decision about whether you're going to do the Green Run test or not? And if not, how will you address some of the criticism of that proposal from such organizations as the uh, Aerospace Safety Advisory Panel? So a couple of things. The SLS rocket is a, a first of its kind. It's the biggest rocket ever built in human history. It's the most powerful rocket ever built in human history taller than the Statue of Liberty, so there's a lot of things that go into this that are firsts. And of course, as we go through the development, we find new things that we need to fix or correct. Uh, that being said, yes, there have been slips. As you're aware, we are committed to cost and schedule. We are making changes with personnel at the top of the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate. We've already had that discussion in order to make sure that we have realistic schedules and that we are sticking to those realistic schedules and cost. That being said, um, it is absolutely critical that we use that rocket because it's the only capability that can take humans all the way to the moon. So we are making sure we're making the right adjustments. Um, as far as the green run test, which of course you, you brought up, we have made no decisions. Remember, we are changing personnel at the top of human exploration. Um, I want to make sure we get the, those top people in place and then let them look at the program, 
and again, we're talking about very professionals, people that have been doing this for a long time, we're going to find the right person for those jobs, and then ultimately let them make the determination what tests need to be done, can you scale it back? I would suspect it's not, we, we should not not do the green run. The green run is a critical test, um, but how much of a green run do we need to do is the question. So um, the key is this, we want to make sure number one, our astronauts are safe, and number two, we are committed to cost and schedule. One thing, when you talk about the space station and commercializing low Earth orbit, you came out, uh, NASA did not too long ago with a plan that would allow private astronauts to be able to fly to the International Space Station. These are ordinary citizens and be able to go up there. There have been some cost estimates, about $50 million a ride and then plus $35,000 a night. I'm just curious, since you've announced that several weeks ago, have you gotten any interest? Have you had any people say they want to do that? So we have had interest long before we announced it. So the answer is yes, there are people that want to go to space. There are people who are willing to pay to go to space. Um, here's the thing, NASA is not selling those seats. NASA, remember, we are developing commercial crew to take you know, people to the International Space Station, our astronauts. And our goal is to be one customer of many customers to drive down our costs. As you've identified, there are people who want to go that ultimately are not NASA that can offset our costs. So those seats will be sold by commercial providers, and of course we are making available the International Space Station for those same spaceflight participants, um, those same commercial astronauts. So the answer is yes, there is interest. Yes, I think it will be successful, that it will offset our costs, and remember why. Because we need resources to go to the moon sustainably, in other words, to stay, um, and of course with the first woman by 2024 under the Artemis program, and then build those capabilities and technologies for an eventual mission to Mars. You might be interested to know our poll asked people about if space exploration should be taken over by private industry. Low on that list, people responding to that. Does that surprise you? Um, when it depends, the word taken over is kind of a loaded word. Um, so when NASA partners with commercial industry, um, we are very involved in the process. It is not a takeover by commercial industry. It is a partnership, and in fact, commercial industry as far as human spaceflight, could not go forward without NASA. That's a very important kind of point to make. Um, but when you say spaceflight taken over by commercial industry, again, DirecTV, Dish Network, uh, Internet Broadband from Space, these are all commercial capabilities, uh, imaging for Google Maps. <laughs> all of these things are commercially done these days, uh, you, and they used to be done by the government. So you can call it a commercial takeover, or you can call it an offset to government costs for doing things that have become routine, and that's called development and advancement, and we support that at NASA. Uh, we have time for about one more question. All right, <clears throat> we're celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo, and now we're talking about going back to the moon with Artemis. Yes. What lessons can we take from Apollo and apply to Artemis, and what things do we have to do differently this time around? So that's a, a wonderful question, and there's a lot. Uh, first of all, what we know is this. Um, celebrating the 50th anniversary of Apollo, we know that when America does absolutely stunning achievements, it gets celebrated for years to come. And when we celebrate the 50th anniversary of Apollo this year, in fact, this month, um, the whole world is watching all of this programming with us, celebrating with us. And this shapes the perceptions of people all over the world towards the United States of America in a very positive way so that young people could grow up maybe seeing a perception different than what they would hear in their home countries given some of the geopolitics involved these days. Uh, one example I like to talk about is when we landed InSight on Mars back in November of last year. It was on the cover of a, or it was in a newspaper in Tehran. And the, the newspaper was, quote, the, the hardline, the official hardline newspaper of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. They don't write nice things about the United States, but in this case, they showed this stunning achievement by NASA, the eighth time in human history that we've landed on Mars, and children, <laughs> in this country, young people in this country, um, were able to see a great story about NASA and in fact our international partners. Great, great stories. That being said, we need to think about the future. What are the stunning achievements that we can do that ultimately people will be celebrating 50 years afterwards? I talked to the president just uh, a few short weeks ago and, and he said very clearly, he goes, I know you gotta go to the moon to get to Mars, but talk about Mars because Mars is that generational achievement that will capture the imagination of the American people. And he's absolutely right. So we are going to continue talking about why we go to the moon. It's the proving ground for the mission to Mars. 
The challenge with Apollo is that it ended. It was not sustainable because the costs were too high. So when we go to the moon, we're, dr we're driving commercial opportunities into it. We're driving reusability into the architecture, driving down the cost. We're learning from Apollo what not to do. We need it all to be reusable. We need to drive down the cost, and we need to keep our eyes on the horizon goal. The goal is not the moon. The goal is, in fact, Mars. And in the last year, we've discovered complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars. The building blocks for life exist on Mars. They don't exist on the moon. They exist on Mars. Liquid water, 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. Liquid water on Earth, anywhere it is, there's life. I'm not saying there's life on Mars, but the probability just went up. And the methane cycles on Mars are commensurate with the seasons of Mars. Probability of life just went up. So when we think about what are these generational discoveries, these generational achievements, discovering life on a world that's not Earth would be a generational achievement. We are focused on Mars. One of the challenges with Apollo, it ended because it, it wasn't cost effective, it wasn't reusable, there were no commercial partners, and it was the destination. The moon is the proving ground. How do we live and work on another world sustainably? Mars is the destination. We need those stunning monumental achievements. The NASA Administrator, our guest on Newsmakers, Jim Bridenstine, here to have a conversation about space policy. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. We'll be right back.